What's good, Joe? What's yeah. up, y'all? What's going on on Facebook? We finally started a band. Yeah. Stay tuned, y'all. Yeah. Which I am not. <laughs> <laughs> What's going on, everybody, and welcome to Fred Doc City, the behind-the-scenes look at Fred Rock City. Let's get it in. So jumping right in, Fred Rock City can be seen as the opening anthem for Songs of Life and Love Volume 2, being the first track on the album. Now, seeing as how this is a Volume 2, yes, it's a sequel. The Songs of Life and Love series is a universal story about the rise, fall, redemption of a man who is struggling to find his place in the world, to find balance, success, happiness, and yes, ultimately love. So as a recap, Volume 1 is about the lead character's traumatic breakup, quote-unquote, with his girlfriend, Cindy. Turns out the whole thing was manipulated by another girl named Wanda just to get back at his girlfriend. He's made to believe that Cindy is leaving him to be with a man with more money, as he's just a struggling rapper. Being so insecure, our hero assumes all these lies to be true, without giving Cindy a chance to explain what happened. Honestly though, the hero's own inner turmoil is mostly what sets all of this into motion. Had he just been more rational about the situation and talked with Cindy, it would have all been avoided. However, this chaotic scenario is necessary in order to grow and work through these insecurities. Now with that being established, our hero makes the transition from a broke rapper to a rock star after his buddy Jimmy Bones encourages him to forget Cindy and pursue his longtime dream of starting a funk rock band. They start a band called Polyglamorous and the Hot Sixteens. At first they suck, but after a lot of hard work and practice, a talent scout for a label notices them and sees potential. Eventually they get signed, blow up, and make millions of dollars. Polyglamorous and the Hot Sixteens becomes a household name. Now you'd think this would be all fine and well, but not for our hero. He's still bitter about what happened with Cindy. With that, even though he's enjoyed great success financially, this is something that will continue to haunt him. This sets up Volume 2. So after an epic world tour, our hero is sort of caught up in the polyglamorous character and returns home, along with his buddies in the band. It's their chance to finally celebrate, show off, reconnect, all that. Now in the case of our lead character, it's a chance to spite Cindy though, and prove to her that she made a mistake by dumping him. Of course, none of this is true, but from his perspective, this is what happened. Cindy even makes attempts to reconnect with him, but he uses crowds of roaring fans, bodyguards, and getaway vehicles like Ferraris and limos to shut her down. He thinks she just wants to reconnect with him to use him, but she actually wants to explain that all of this is a misunderstanding. Another classic influence we have here is The Crossroads, the timeless tale of selling one's soul to the devil in exchange for great power and wealth. There are some perks, but only temporary ones at best. And of course, the moral being that the things gained are far less valuable than the things lost. I make references to this by adding more of the rock element, demonic laughs, and an even more direct mentions of this in the lyrics, talking about this ill-fated exchange. A lot of times, when we think of this crossroads story, we think of rock stars, maybe even old blues musicians like Robert Johnson, However, we can go back to Paganini, who was thought to have made some kind of pact with the devil. We can go back even further to Theophilus, who is a dissatisfied cleric. He also makes a deal, but is redeemed by the Virgin Mary. The original figure is often thought of as Jesus himself, but I suspect that there's an even older version, to be honest. Faust's influence, however, is felt also, as this theme is sometimes referred to as a Faustian bargain. And for those who aren't familiar with Faust, it's basically the same story. So now we come to Fred Rock City itself, the first chapter of the second volume. The tone of this video is clearly darker, as I convey that something has changed since the last volume. Dirty distorted guitars, drinking and drug use, all the decadent elements of the damaged rock star. Right off the bat, I start the video off with a short skit to set the mood. The funny thing about this skit is that it was actually inspired by something to happen shortly before the video was finished. Hello. I'm Dtron5000. I'm Daryltron's assistant. Sometimes, human interactions can be complicated. Human emotion can sometimes cloud one's judgment. I'm here to clarify some things. 
someone Daryltron had known for many years heard some of the tracks from Volume 1, and said he was running from his past, that that's why he was making songs that all sound the same, not talking about his old friends in his songs, and just in general, not making music with as much variety as he once did. That he'd changed, and was just being sober him. Okay, let's stop right there. Let's look at the official liner notes for Volume 1. This was a concept album that I'd come up with around 2001. It's a concept because it was originally intended to be a three-part story mode project, skits and everything, telling the odyssey of an alternate universe me. The story is, I become fed up with being a broke rapper, and I mistakenly believe my girlfriend left me. As a form of revenge, I change my name to Polly Glamorous and become a rock star, living a decadent lifestyle. It eventually catches up to me, of course. That gives these songs some context. I didn't finish the skits, but you can piece together the main parts of the story here. The songs. Ironically, or maybe not, this story turned out to be somewhat prophetic. I'd face many of the themes, the trials and tribulations expressed in these songs. However, this served to only give my album more depth, actually living out the album. A very meta experience. It's been an epic journey, for sure, and appreciate everyone who helped me along the way. Hope you enjoy. My function is not to sound petty, or pick on this guy. It's just that, that's a very interesting perspective, albeit, an inaccurate one. In any case, it opens up a dialogue about the album. It provides a good backstory. Let me analyze this, and explain why it's wrong. So, Daryl Tron came up with the idea for this concept album in 2001. He kept putting it off though, because he wanted to be clean before he released it, so he could do it justice. In that time from 2001 to 2017, yes, his approach to music was more sporadic. But when he finally released this album last year in 2023, with five years of sobriety by this time, it was meant to have a theme. He needed something more cohesive, to build this world that Polly lived in. In his friend's mind, he thought Daryltron came up with these songs after Daryltron had gotten clean, and was taking some conservative approach to music. This is not true. Also, my calculations lead me to believe that not only did this friend not read the liner notes, and understand there was a theme or story behind it, but, he hadn't listened to the rest of the album at all. Which, while having a more uniform feel than Daryl Tron's older material, doesn't sound as similar to each other than the two singles this friend talked about. Those were her man and live it up. This friend said they were the same song, but after analyzing the two files, this is not accurate. In any case, it's never a good idea to listen to two singles from an album, and use that to determine an artist's catalog. Or, neglect the fact that they even have an album. This is insufficient data, even for a human. Poly Glamorous is meant to represent the idea of selling out, and creating commercial music. The theme of aggressic 80s pop culture is very prevalent here. The irony is that this friend's critique actually proves that this aesthetic Daryltron was going for, was successfully expressed in the album, to some degree. To be sure though, the album in its entirety has its curveballs. Funk, techno, rap, jazz, blues, and other various genres are all thrown in at some point, despite the moments of commercial influence. Again, you have to listen the album as a whole to hear this, which in this case didn't happen. Also, if they'd known the story, it doesn't sound like the one of a person who's running from his issues. It deals with addiction, loss, hardships of all kinds. As far as not mentioning his friends, Daryl Tron didn't even know the people this friend spoke of. Not in 2001. However, Daryl Tron did add them into some of the skits. To be fair, these skits haven't been released to the public yet. Daryl Tron plans to release those at some point, but even so, Daryl Tron wanted to stick with the original 2001 story version mostly. Those people come up at a later time in his life, and will be in another project. It's interesting, that Daryl Tron predicted a lot of the themes that would become a part of his life before they happened, as if he knew on some intuitive level that he would go through these things. On a side note, Daryl Tron's trials and tribulations would only add to this story, merging real life experience with this story concept. 
On top of that, to hear that he's running away, when in fact, this is Daryl Tron finally releasing a recovery album, and telling his story in a creative way, is very ironic. Based on my understanding of human behavior, the fact that someone Daryl Tron was once so close with, doesn't even know about the album, or that it's a story album, just shows how far they've grown apart. They're just getting a glimpse of what Daryl Tron does from a far distance basically. So it makes sense what they're seeing isn't accurate. Thank you, my human friends. Like this makes the story even more meta as I added this incident as the opening skit. In this case, the old me is talking to the new self in the video call, where the old me is saying I've changed and lost touch with my roots. We can also note the demonic laugh and feeling I've been drawn into some kind of dark force. But yeah, here's the idea of running from the past. It's so interesting that this happened with my friend right as I was working on the video, which deals with this theme. In this case, a dual self, old me versus the new me, or little old Daryl confronting this new polyglamorous persona that's taken over and become a being of its own. Art imitating life, imitating art. I'm really blurring the lines here. Okay, here we are with the crowd, setting up the feel of a big rock band about to play. Now some shots of Frederick. For those of you who don't know, this is a city in Western Maryland. Not a huge city, but not a small town. Just a cool place and home to Poly Glamorous in the hot 16s. Here I am walking down the graffiti hallway in downtown. Now here I am in Hotel 6, looking at a picture of me and Cindy. I'll get to this later in the documentary. This has some significance. Here's three of us in Poly Glamorous in the hot 16s. It was originally supposed to be some guys from another band, but I like this better in a way. So we have my buddy Matt and the ever classic Batman of Frederick. Matt is an actual rapper himself who goes by subconscious. I'll leave some links to his music as well as the Batman of Frederick's fan page. Another view of Frederick. Back at the hotel room, drinking what's actually vinegar. Like I was saying, I quit drinking, so I decided to use this instead. Still gives the effect though, because it has a kick to it. I thought it'd be cool to get some 80s style projector scenes. Only after the fact that I realized that one of my other buddies is in the footage I was using to project on me, where people are hanging out downtown, or in this case, Fred Rock. I wanted to add some vintage rocker footage, like someone had recorded over some other things on a VHS tape. More band stuff. Here we get some glimpses of downtown again, including Hippie Che Hummus. This is a really good spot. If you ever get a chance to eat there, by all means, check it out. This part was a little tricky as Batman had to walk backwards with the camera while we maintained a certain pace. You'll notice how we keep skipping back and forth between me and the hotel room and walking around downtown. I'll get to that later as well. I like how the music doesn't actually line up with playing. This is reminiscent of old corny movies or music videos which is obviously an influence, because this series could be thought of as like an out-universe 70s or 80s thing. I like how this section turned out because I'm using AI again for this limo that fades in. However, unlike with the last video, I didn't want this to be so obvious. The way it blends in, I think it actually looks quite realistic. Now I'm talking about El Caminos here. Cars are obviously a big part of the rock culture from the very beginning. Hot rods, muscle cars, all that kind of stuff. In a way, I'm tapping into rock at its earliest stages as well. All eras from about the 50s to the 80s is what I'm going for. It's the universal appeal across different decades. With that being said, the car wash obviously plays an important role as well. Talking about keeping these said El Caminos clean. This is a fun part as well, walking through downtown Fred Rock, as if to say, here we are, walking down the strip. Now here's where a fantasy and reality combine once again. I'd forgotten that there was supposed to be a scene where I'm talking to some girls, being that I'm back in town as polyglamorous, pressing all the chicks. But as fate would have it though, I ended up running into a few ladies I know in this unscripted scene. So to get an idea of how that went down, I'm not exactly sure what was said here. Something about asking their permission to be in the video, joking about giving them my autograph, that kind of stuff. Get the hell out of here. <laughs> Check this out. <laughs> they go, uh oh. <laughs> what? <laughs> My mom 
my autograph. We should leave my autograph. Look at this. This is this is a good video. <laughs> That's funny, Daryl just walking and all of a sudden he bumps into two chicks. What's up, ladies? <laughs> then a little later, this other person I met recently comes up, and he does some tailoring for suits. <laughs> I think I'm gonna keep this footage. Yeah, keep it. I'm yeah. gonna keep this footage. <laughs> yeah, keep it. It's good. I know. I'm gonna keep this footage. Little outtake. Yeah. Another nice projector scene here. Very anthematic hook section. Now we're walking out to the Batmobile. This part was funny because I was originally going to actually play the guitar solo in real time along with the recording then match them up later, synchronize them. For the record, I played this guitar solo on a keyboard to give it a somewhat synthy 80s feel, but I can't actually play that solo on guitar. As it turns out though, I wasn't able to amplify the guitar while we filmed this, so I couldn't hear what I was actually playing live. I was able to fake it, and with my experience with stringed instruments, I was able to fake it just enough to make it passable. But like I was saying, that was part of the charm, I believe. Now this scene is interesting because you can't see it at night here, but the address of the hotel here is 999. Upside down, of course, is 666. This is the second time something like this happened to me that I know of. The other time being when I was filming my one video, Rock and Roll. People are going to start thinking I'm in some kind of cult or something. I can assure you, if I was, I have no problem with things like amps. But yeah, I can see where all the culty rumors start to pop up about people. Or who knows, perhaps some strange cosmic forces at play. Well, in any case, that's a documentary for another day. Okay, now some Pick of Destiny action. Gotta have Tenacious D if we're talking about Rock. And some more Devil references. Rock and the Devil have a long history, so we're really getting in those vibes here. Same with this clip, a little AI image of the Devil face flashing in for a second. Here I am in sort of a daze of Rock decadence. Once again, overlapping into an AI-generated video. Like the other one, I don't think you can really tell as much. They'd recently updated the AI software too, right before I made this. And I noticed how the things they generate are a bit more convincing, a bit more realistic. Okay, here we are getting out of the car, walking towards the hotel. By now you might be able to start guessing what's going on here with the storyline. I thought this would be a neat little segment, almost like a stop motion kind of vibe going on here as I get out of the bed and over to do some lines or whatever it is that rock stars do. Uh, for the record, I was actually using that vitamin C supplement, Emergency, for the fake cocaine. So if I snort that, I'm going to get a really good healthy dose of vitamin C. Doesn't sound very rock and roll though. I thought it did the trick though. It's just what I happened to have around. Alright, here we come up the stairs. After the fact, I realized, okay, Batman's walking with me. Then all of a sudden, now he's not in the scene. I think it's cooler that way, just by myself. And maybe we'll just say, okay, you can stay behind and be a lookout. Something like that. Add that to the story. I didn't think to include that scene, but it actually kind of works out in the end. But a lot of things like that happen, as we were just trying to keep track of all the other details. You know how I made a note of that? The version of me in the hotel room, and the version of me in the white suit? They're like two separate entities. Both me, but one's the old me, and one's the new rock star version of me, polyglamorous. This is the plot twist at the end, where we realize, going back to the intro skit, that it was my old innocent self talking to this new self. So now this is where I really drive that concept home. This idea didn't come into being until during the production of the video, so it's cool I was able to add that in and edit it in the way that brought that concept together. Here I am with my Glock pellet gun. It's a real Glock, just not a full-on gun. It's just basically a BB gun. And I added that gun flash by green screening it in, quote unquote. Bam. So we have the symbology of polyglamorous killing his old self. This is the end of innocence. And it's like, okay, Polly is here now. This is a new era. My old self was weak. Now I'm a stronger, more cold and vicious version. Kind of freaky, right? 
Looking back, I could have done a split screen thing earlier in the scene, but I think it actually has more impact by waiting till the very end to see the old me and polyglamorous at once. On one level, it might seem more fakey that we're not in the same frame as much, but I think it kind of works better. Also kind of like the music not quite matching up with the band scenes, I think it just adds to the retro charm as well. Okay, now we get a really good look finally, the picture of me and Cindy. I was looking at it earlier, and maybe you couldn't even tell what that was, and that makes it cool I think too, it's mysterious. And you remember me saying this also had significance? Some of you might recognize this scene from Her Man, the first single from volume one. So now we can see that the old me was lamenting over the loss of that relationship, thinking back to happier times in the past, and drinking and drugging, trying to cope with this. This part is kind of eerie, as it suddenly cuts out to the tape ending, and this number popping up. I saw once again the code being two sixes, ending with the six as well. I didn't notice that at the time either. I always gotta have these clips, so yeah, let's take a look at some of the outtakes. Okay, great. All right, it's recording. Give me one second. Give me one second. Okay, got it. Oh, Daryl, we gotta do it over again. My bad, man. That's okay. You gotta do it over again. I'm sorry. I just, I, 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 I just gotta do it over again. As long as we got it up to that point. Yeah, but I ran through the box. I didn't see this box. My bad. We have, you might have to do it over again. Um, I think we already we'll do it over again. All right. That way we can. You missed the box. You were lucky, but I, I didn't see the box. So we, okay, so we can do it over again. Yeah. Okay, cool. Ready? Take two. Take two and right. action. Nice. I'm gonna see what that looks like. Mm. Like for real, I was feeling that one. I know I fucked up in a couple places near the end, but other than that, like the majority of it, like yeah. that was fire. Yeah, no, that was cool. And I thought like um I actually handled myself pretty well. Like I could tell like I was not like hitting the right notes at all. Like it's probably good that I was not plugged in. Thank you. Ready? Yep. Is it on? Yep. Go. Cool. Go for it. All right, cool. cool. Right. Hey, hey, what's up, man? Hey, All right, so, okay, so we're sitting uh, here drinking some fake alcohol. Yeah, okay. We'll go, hold up. Put the screen up there. Oh, okay. Yeah, put the screen up there. Right. I'm gonna I'm, 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 like, see yourself. Once again, I'm gonna sit here like that. Hold on. All right, we're documenting. Hold on. We're documenting. Batman doing a shot. A doing a shot. shot. Okay, ready? I'm gonna be like this, hanging out. Just here, go like this. It's vinegar. Go like this. Yeah. And I'm gonna look at the drugs. I'm gonna look at the drugs. All right, look at the drugs. Look, yeah, look at the drugs. Look at this. Yeah, you want to do it? You want to do it? You're probably thinking, "Ooh, that shit's strong." And then, and then you take the drink. You're gonna do it. And you go. Try it out. How is it? <laughs> kind of strong. Mm. You alright? <laughs> Wow, how is it? It's insane. Okay, cool. Yeah, we'll see. That'll work. I wonder if I look limp enough. <laughs> now I'm just supposed to be like, don't shoot me. Alright, cool. Cool. That's it. That's it. I guess I'll have to do a scene where I'm like, alright, here I am drinking and doing whatever. Yeah, I was just drinking whatever. I was just like, I was like, yeah, yeah. I'm hot already. I'm hot, bro. I know. Okay. Then you fucking gonna do the go. Okay. Boom. That's it. That's it. Cool. <laughs> you alright? <Yeah. laughs> Where the fuck did he go? Go, go, go! Ooh, Ooh, baby. Baby. Come on, get the ride! Right. <laughs> <laughs>
Bingo. Nice. That was a lot better. Ah. Is, your, is your camera saying low battery? Cool. Is that practice? Oh, I won't. It's good. I'll be good. <laughs> no, it's okay. Hey, That's right. Tonight. You had to record. Say, what up? Don't. Yeah, yeah. don't. Hi. You are currently being recorded. Oh, we don't want that. Okay. Okay, cool. Boom. Let's see what it looks like. Man, that little voice had to come on. I know, right? Ghost in here. Ghost in here. There's a ghost in the There's a ghost in here. Call the Ghostbusters. Yeah. And then boom. Nice. Nice. Cool. That actually tastes pretty good. Now, now it's filming. Recording. Now it's filming. Now it's filming. Let me go ahead and back up a little bit. Okay. All right. And then okay. Go ahead. And I'll is, catch up with you. Is anybody, is anybody behind me? I don't think so. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. It's like normal speed. Work. I am. I am. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. All right. That's a start. Let's see how it looks. I know it's kind of tricky. That thing vibrates. From here, and just try it like, well, that thing really vibrates. And then just go ahead and just, don't wait for me, just go ahead and start going and I'll catch up to you. Okay, just ready? Go ahead. Light, camera, right, action. Cool. Go, go, go. All right, go ahead, just keep going. I'll start further back. Go ahead and keep going. That way it gives you a chance to kind of like, all right, yeah, there we go. Ah! Come on. All right, that's cool. All right, thank you guys as always for checking out the documentary. Catch you guys on the flip side. All right, peace. What's good, Fred Rock? How y'all feeling tonight? Hey, let me tell you something.